everybody, Facebook Live land. We're uh, so thankful that you're here. Uh, Cuyahoga County has gone through the yellow, and so we're excited about that. But at the same time, uh, we want to be utterly respectful of social distancing and everything. So we're trying to remain six feet apart uh, in everything we do, and, and everybody's masked up when we're, when we're uh, down and about. And uh, so as we tonight and um, we just pray that you would be with us uh, in spirit and as we sing some praise songs and as we uh, listen to Pastor Brad Freak. So I'm going to open us with a word of prayer and uh, we'll go from there into some announcements. Dear Jesus, thank you so much that uh, even though we're not all together in the flesh, we are together in spirit and in unity. That um, though there is uh, this Christian crisis that uh, you, God, are all powerful and you are all loving. You are going before us in our rear guard and everything. So, Lord, I pray that you would be here. I pray you would be in the homes where people are watching uh, and, and wanting to hear from you. I pray that you would speak to them, Lord, through praise, through singing, through uh, preaching. I just pray, Lord, that you would be uh, a strong God that you are, that you would save, even over the internet, that you would save. Lord, I bless this service. I bless your name, and we lift your name high with everything we do. Amen.
everybody. Welcome to the Vineyard. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, we want to welcome you tonight to our service. And we're just going to check here, make sure, all right, I'm getting the thumbs up, we are good to go. Um, if you are joining us uh, tonight for the first time, or even if you've been tuning in uh, to us over the last several weeks, things look a little bit differently tonight. Um, we are working through some processes to try to both stream well online, um, as well as prepare for um, a time when we can get together and worship even in smaller groups. And so tonight we have just a small group of people here kind of uh, being our test subjects, and they have got a lot of notes to take. Um, but we are glad that we can get together, whatever means um, it is, uh, just to worship and to um, hear God's word. So we thank you for joining us. If you are joining us Facebook Live, in just a few moments, you're going to receive in the comments of this video um, a few different links. The first link will be to our digital connection card. And this is a card uh, that's just how we stay connected here at the Vineyard. So if you are joining us for the first time, we would love to hear where you're coming from, how you heard about us. Um, and if you're a regular attender, please fill out that card. Let us know how we can pray for you. Um, there's a couple different things you can sign up or get more information about. You can do that all from your connection card. Um, the next link is a link uh, to our bulletin. And so that bulletin, you can uh, click on the link, download, print off, or just follow along from your computer. Um, that has all the information um, about tonight's uh, message. So you can check that out. The third link is our giving statement. And so if you would like to give a financial gift to the vineyard, you can do so by clicking that link. Um, we appreciate all the gifts that are given uh, to the ministry here of the vineyard. And so those things will be popping up um, on the comment section of the video. Before we get into tonight's uh, message, I do want to just go over a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, for, for regular attenders, uh, Friday you should have received an email um, about some vineyard mini worship uh, services. And so, as Jason said moments ago, we are in the yellow phase, which does allow groups of um, 25 or less to gather. Um, so. We have put together some protocols and precautions to make sure that we are following all recommended guidelines, but also um, in an event for us to kind of just gather together, even if it is in smaller groups. And so um, please check out that email. If you did not receive it, please uh, comment in the section of the video below so we know and we can get you the information. There is a survey in there that we're requesting everyone to take. Um, our plan right now is to run, starting next Sunday, four services, um, 9.30, 11 a.m., 4.30, and 6 p.m., um, with a limited attendance of, of no more than 25 people here in the building. So we just take that survey. It'll allow you to pick some times that you might be, want to join um, in one of those services, and then we will produce a schedule and get that out this week. Um, if you are not comfortable just yet gathering together, we completely understand that as well. And so don't feel um, any pressure to, to um, fill out in a time slot. You can simply say that you're not interested in attending those services just yet. We will continue to produce our um, services on Facebook Live at 6 p.m. our normal time every Sunday. So if you, if you want to play it safe, Safer, that's perfectly fine. You can check us out on Facebook Live. Um, for those that maybe you're ready just to gather in smaller groups, then this will be an option for you as well. So please, again, check your email. Lots of information in there. And throughout the week, you'll be receiving more information about our little mini worship services. Um, a couple other real quick things. Our family food boxes and our sunshine boxes are still um, being distributed <coughs> Uh, we gave away another six boxes today, and we're, we're gathering a list already for next week. So if you know someone that maybe could use some additional food, um, encouragement, and support, uh, please get in touch with the church so that we can get those things to them. Same with the Sunshine Box. If you know someone that's kind of feeling isolated and alone, um, there's just a lot of neat little stuff in there to help them feel, feel happy and uh, cheerful. So get those names to us. You can also do that on that digital connection card. Um, and that's all the announcements we're going to go through for today. Um, so 
check out everything uh, either on our Facebook page that's going on, or you can check our website at wellsboroughvineyard.org. Uh, and thank you. So, um, as Jason said during worship, we are starting a new little mini-series um, today, and, and we're going to go through the next three weeks anyway, um, of what we're calling, or I'm calling, unplanned, trusting God when life takes a turn. And so, um, I think probably every one of us at this juncture um, in history can say that there is something in life that has come up that is unplanned. Um, and, and if not, if you had planned for all of this, uh, I really need to know your secret because um, you did a really good job. Uh, but, you know, as I was kind of thinking how to even introduce tonight's message, I was, I was kind of just struck and, and didn't know how to begin. But um, tonight uh, provided a perfect example uh, I'm coming to you live right now just from a cell phone. So the, uh, the quality of the picture probably isn't as good as it's been in the last several weeks. Uh, the sound, I can't really tell. You'll have to be the judge of that. Um, that was not our plan. Uh, we're here several times throughout the week um, working through technology. Uh, we kind of just got things settled to produce live, and, and we kind of like the way that's going, so we want to continue that level and improve on that, um, and, and then we're back to trying to make it work when people are in the building as well, and so there's a lot of maneuvering and technology that has to, to be handled and changed and directed, and so all that to say, uh, the plan was that this service was going to be spectacular. It was going to be an audio-visual wonder. Um, and I was here last night for three or four hours just working through, making sure everything was working the way we wanted. I turned off the computer with confidence, thinking it was pretty good. Um, when we came in today, nothing was the same. And so, not in the plan. Um, and so we kind of, I just said, you know what, turn it off. We'll do an iPhone Facebook Live. And so here we are. Um, this series is about those times where you just you have a plan and it looks really good and you and you you've got something that you're really looking forward to and then life just takes a turn. And and those plans that you had um, kind of just seem to fall away. But we can still trust God even in those times when, when life takes a turn. And so tonight we are going to be studying the life of Joseph. And it's going to be a quick study, but I think if you're familiar with the story of Joseph, you know that this is a guy who had a cool plan that turned every which way. Um, and so we're going to take a look at his story and what we can learn about trusting God in the midst of that. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together, Lord, both virtually. And Lord, I just thank you for this small group of people who are here just kind of testing out all these different guidelines and protocols, Lord. Um, it wasn't in our plan to do this, Lord. It wasn't in our plan to, to have to distance uh, from one another. It wasn't in our plan to, to stop meeting as a church. It wasn't in our plan to, to wear face masks, Lord. But God, I know that, that you aren't a stranger to any of the things that have happened. And so, Lord, help us tonight to, as we study the life of Joseph, um, really just see how we can trust in you even when our plans uh, just turn south of us. We ask that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts, uh, Lord, that amidst anything that we may be going through, any wrong turns that our life has taken, God, um, that we uh, could learn to trust you. In your holy name we praise and thank you. Amen. Amen. 
So as I said, we're going to be talking about the life of Joseph. Um, and so Joseph, you can find this whole story um, starting in Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, uh, chapter 37, is where we're introduced to him and his story. And it carries on for several chapters. Don't worry, I'm not going to read this word for word. I am going to just kind of narrate through the life of, life of Joseph. And then we're going to see what three things that we can learn um, from Joseph and, and the way his life uh, took a turn. So starting off in chapter 37, we are introduced to Joseph, who is a young man of 17 years old. Um, he is uh, the, the son of Jacob. Um, he's got a slew of brothers. Um, but Joseph is the baby at this point. He's a, a young man that is handsome, um, well-built. He's kind of like your Ivy League guy, okay? Um, everybody wants to be Joseph. Um, it, but he has a slight problem. His brothers, um, they really don't like him so much. As the baby, uh, Joseph was kind of the father's favorite. And so the brothers, that kind of got under their skin. And so when we first meet Joseph, we hear about Joseph, and he has a couple dreams. And the dreams that he has, um, both of them allude to the fact that Joseph one day would rise above his brothers. And his brothers would one day bow down to him. Well, you can imagine in a family where the brothers already were kind of had, there was some dissension that didn't, uh, didn't sit well with those brothers. And so um, Joseph is kind of now ostracized by his, his brothers. They, they really don't like him much at all. And so one day, the brothers are out tending the sheep. Uh, and the father, Jacob, says to Joseph, hey, go out and check on your brothers, see where they're at. So Joseph goes out, and as he's searching for his brothers, uh, the scripture says that they saw him coming, and they started plotting on how they might kill him. I mean, that's how badly they didn't like him. And so they had this plot to kill them. Uh, one of the brothers, Reuben, though, wasn't really agreeable to the plot, and so he... He kind of talked to the brothers, hey, let's just throw him in this well. Um, Reuben's plan was to then come back and rescue Joseph. So as Joseph is making his way to his brothers, um, the oldest brother, Judah, says, hey, you know what? Why don't we um, not kill him? You know, we'll just sell him to this merchant and sell him into slavery. And so the plan becomes that the, the, these brothers would sell Joseph into slavery. And that's exactly what they do. And so they sell them into slavery, and they take off, um, and they make up a, a story about how uh, Joseph was eaten by wild animals, um, which, of course, just was a tragic loss to the father. And so Joseph is sold into slavery, headed towards Egypt. The brothers come. They share that their brother has been torn to pieces. Uh, the father's in mourning. Um, skip ahead to chapter 39. Uh, we find that Joseph is indeed taken to Egypt as a slave, and he's purchased by a, a man named Potiphar. Um, and Potiphar was one of Pharaoh's officials. And so he was purchased by Potiphar, and he goes in to um, work as a slave in Potiphar's home. Um, and he does very well. Joseph is a very smart slave, a very good slave. And so before long, he is given um, kind of command of Potiphar's entire household. Um, and so not bad for a slave. Uh, Joseph kind of works and, and does a good job. Uh, but then uh, because of his well-built, handsome uh, nature, um, Potiphar's wife, uh, gets the hots for him, let's say. And so she is encouraging him um, to have an affair. Um, but jo Joseph is an upstanding young man, and, and he kind of pushes her advances away. And so one day, um, she again makes an advance at Joseph. Um, he scatters. He takes out running, but he leaves his cloak um, with her. So she fabricates a story that, that Joseph indeed did come and try to make advances at her and, and try to force her into a relationship. And so because of that, 
Potiphar got very angry, and he sends Joseph to prison. So Joseph goes to prison, and just like he did when he was a slave, he worked hard, um, and he became a model prisoner. So much so that the prison, the prisoner or the prison guard put him in charge of the other prisoners. And so he is there working um, as, a, as a prisoner, but in charge of other prisoners. And one day, um, the, uh, two men from Pharaoh's court are thrown into jail. There's a, a cupbearer and a baker. And these guys make Pharaoh very angry. And so he, they're put in prison, um, and one night, they both have a dream. Um, and so the next morning, they wake up, and they're sharing this dream this dream, and, and Joseph says, I'll interpret the dream. So, so uh, the cupbearer shares his dream, um, the baker shares his dream, and, and Joseph says, oh, okay, to the cupbearer, um, you are going to be, in three days, you're going to be taken to Fort Pharaoh, and he's going to restore you. Um, he says to the baker, in three days, you're going to be taken to Fort uh, Pharaoh, and you're going to be impaled. And so um, you can imagine the baker was a little upset about that. Um, but three days come, and lo and behold, the, the cupbearer and the baker are taken before Pharaoh. The cupbearer is restored. The baker is impaled. And Joseph said one thing to the, the men when they um, when he interpreted the dream. He said, when you talk to Pharaoh, tell him about me. And well, the cupbearer forgot to say anything. And so Joseph continued to be in prison until the day that Pharaoh has a dream. And uh, so Pharaoh has a couple dreams back to back. He scours the countryside looking for people, anyone that could interpret this dream, and no one can do it. Um, and then the cupbearer conveniently remembers that, oh, when I was in prison, there was a guy that interpreted my dream. Um, he was a Hebrew, um, but he was right on. And so Pharaoh sends for Joseph. And Joseph comes to before Pharaoh, and he explains the dream, and Joseph interprets the dream. And he says, basically, that the dream is a, is a prophecy that for seven years, Egypt would have great plenty, great abundance. But seven years later, there would be a huge famine. And so Joseph encouraged Pharaoh, you need to find a man um, who can, can plan, who is intelligent, and is able to make a plan so that Egypt will survive this famine. Well, Pharaoh doesn't think there's anyone better than Joseph. So he takes Joseph from the prison and makes him second in command. Uh, no one is greater but Pharaoh. And so he puts Joseph gives Joseph the mission of uh, making a plan for Pharaoh uh, or for Egypt to survive. And so Joseph, being the, the upstanding guy he is, gets right to work. And so he begins to develop a plan to save Egypt. And he does this for a, a number of years, and he marries an Egyptian, and he has a couple children, and he becomes this very powerful official in the court of Pharaoh. Um, things were going great. Uh, the years of plenty end. The famine comes. It's time to start giving grain out to the people as, as the famine hits. And so Joseph is in charge of making sure that the grain is being sold and, and gotten out to the people. And lo and behold, some figures from his past appear before him. His brothers come, and they try to buy grain, and Joseph recognizes them, yet they do not recognize Joseph. And so, um, Joseph talks with them, and, and they explain that, that they have a younger brother at home. Uh, Joseph gets a little irate. He accuses his brothers of being spies in the land. Um, so he, he works out this plan that one brother will stay, and he'll send everyone else home with grain, um, but they have to return with the younger brother. And so um, the brothers, are, they, 
They do it. Joseph gives them grain. He actually gives them their silver back. He sends them home uh, to the father. Now, the father, having lost the son already, um, is not keen on the plan of his new youngest son, Benjamin, going back to Egypt with the brother. In fact, he says if anything was to happen to his youngest son, he it would send him to his grave. And so some time passes, and, and the famine gets worse, and finally Jacob agrees that, yes, they could take Benjamin, and they should take a bunch of presents, and they should go back to Joseph in Egypt to buy more grain um, and to get their, their brother back. And so they take their second journey into Egypt where uh, they come before Joseph. And um, Joseph, after meeting his younger brother, he never met him, Benjamin, uh, invites them to his house and he throws this big party and he feeds them. Um, and, and yet still hides his identity. And so um, they, spent, they spent some time there. When it's time to leave, Joseph gives them their silver back again. He gives them grain. He sends everyone home. But he has this little plan that he puts in place. And he has a servant hide a silver cup in Benjamin's bag. And so as the, the party of, of um, Hebrews heads out of Egypt, um, the guard rushes out, stops them, um, accuses them of stealing, brings them back to Joseph's palace, um, and one by one they search the bags. And lo and behold, in Benjamin's bag is this cup. And so Joseph says, oh, you know, the rest of you are free to go, but this one's mine. And the brothers are distraught. They know that if they don't come home with Benjamin, uh, the father will just be um, head to the grave. And so they um, go to Joseph and say, take me, instead. Like, my brother has to return, take me. And, and so there's this discussion, and, and Joseph eventually reveals himself to his brothers. And as he reveals himself, he invites them and their family and their father to return or come back and live in the land of Egypt, um, where they'll be saved from the famine and they can be uh, provided for and prosper. Okay? That is a very like quick telling of like five chapters of, of Genesis and Joseph. Um, but what we can find in Joseph's story in the first point tonight is life happens and plans change. Yep. Joseph had everything going for him. He had like a prophetic dream from God that promised that one day he would kind of be the head of the family and his brothers would bow to him. He was this strappingly handsome young man. He had this whole future planned out, and it was a good future. And it appeared that he even had God's blessing for that future. But then life happened. His brothers Sold him into slavery. That wasn't in the dream. And he, he goes into slavery and he gets comfortable and he, and he does well and he works hard and he becomes this head of all the servants only to be accused wrongfully of, of a crime against Potiphar's wife. His life takes another turn. Life happened. And so he gets sent to prison, and he's in prison, and he works hard, and he does a good job, and he's elevated to the chief prisoner in charge of the other prisoners. And he, he interprets these dreams, and, and his hope is that the, the cupbearer at least will remember him and, and, and talk to Pharaoh. But for, for years, two years I think it is, Nothing said, and so he works hard, and he's in prison, again wrongfully. And then suddenly he's whisked out of prison, and he's put before Pharaoh. And he interprets this dream, and, and almost overnight becomes second in command. Life happens. And there's this other turn that takes place. 
And so he becomes second in command, and he marries, and, and he has children, and, and he's now set up pretty well. Things went from really bad to really good. And life is happening, and then, from the past, comes family, a dysfunctional family at that. And Joseph was once again, life happens, and there's this other turn, and he's forced to deal with this past that's painful. Joseph, like many other uh, people in the scripture, knows well the complexities and the instabilities of living life in this world. He knows that all the plans don't always work out. Life happens. Joseph had a plan. His brothers had a different plan. Joseph had a plan. Living in Potiphar's life, Potiphar's wife had another plan. See, the problem is when we are all making plans, sometimes those plans clash. Sometimes our plans don't match up with everyone else's. And so Joseph had this plan that just didn't match up with other people's plan in his life. If there's anyone, anyone out there whose life has gone exactly as you planned it when you were 16, 17, 18, again, I would love to hear your secret. Jesus says in John 16, 33, in this world you will have trouble. And that trouble often involves a change to our plans. Deaths, divorces, lost jobs, financial hardship, health scares, Severed relationships, cross-country moves, pandemics, addictions, all unplanned situations. And we tend to handle those negative ones in a very crushing way. But there's a truth that we find in Joseph's story which should encourage us and should propel us forward regardless of what unplanned situation occurs in our life. And that is God's protection, presence, and provision are still there. Amidst of life, uh, in the middle of life happening, of plans changing, God's protection, presence, and provision are still there. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. But he concludes that statement with, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In Joseph's story, we see that, that though jo Joseph, Joseph's life takes huge turns, drastic changes, God is right there in the middle of it. God protects Joseph from death. Remember the brothers had plotted to kill him? Genesis 37, 21, but it says, When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into his, this cistern where in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. God was protecting. He, he called the heart of Reuben to protect Joseph's life. Later on in that same chapter, Judah says to the brothers, we will gain nothing if we kill our brother. Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agree. Now that's mighty big of them to agree. But the plan was to kill him. At 17 years old, and yet God protected him. God was with him. He was present with Joseph. And there are a bunch of scriptures in the story. Uh, Genesis 39, 2 and 3. This is when 
Joseph goes into Potiphar's home as a slave. It says the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Later on, several verses down, it says, But while Joseph was there, this time he's in prison. While Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. All of these wrong turns, God not only protected Joseph, but he was with him. He didn't leave him alone. He was with him. And then God provides for him. And he prospers in every situation. He, he was protected. God was there and, and he provided and, and Joseph prospered. Genesis 41, verse 41 says, So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Now think a moment. Joseph has been a slave. He's been a prisoner. And now, overnight, is put in charge of Egypt. The Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And the people shouted before him, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift a hand or foot in all of Egypt. God provided. He provided in, in Potiphar's house. He provided for him in prison. And now he's providing for him in a very prosperous way. Regardless of, of the twists and turns that Joseph took in his life, God was present. He was protective. And he, he provided. And the same is true for us. No matter what is happening to you right now, now, no matter where your life has taken a turn, no matter what plans have been turned upside down, I promise you that God is present in the midst of it. He is protecting and He is providing. He's a God that never leaves or forsakes. And if you're a follower of Jesus, hold on to that truth when life happens, when plans change. If you have yet to put your faith in Jesus Christ, I encourage you to really consider doing that. Jesus came to earth to present or to be present with mankind with a mission of protecting us from sin and death. And to provide us for a new, eternal life. And he did this by taking our wrongdoing, our sin, and becoming a sacrifice for those things that we've done. He died on a cross for those sins. He took our punishment, and then three days later he was raised to life to provide us a restored relationship with God and new, a new life to live. With his death and resurrection, he offers eternal protection and provision. And all we have to do is put our faith in him and ask forgiveness. And if you're listening tonight and you haven't put your faith in Jesus, I encourage you to pray a very simple prayer. Sorry, thank you, please. Sorry, Lord for those sins, for those things that I've done that, that have separated uh, me from you. Thank you for sending Jesus as a provider and a protector. Thank you, Jesus, for taking those sins 
and in being a sacrifice for them. Please, forgive me for those things. And please come into my heart that I would have that new eternal life and restored relationship. And that prayer can be done at any time. And so if you're here tonight and you don't have that confidence that God is present with you, that he is a God that will protect you and, and provide for you. I encourage you to pray that prayer. And then reach out to the vineyard. Reach out to me. Um, I'd love to talk to you about what following Jesus looks like after forgiveness. So we have Joseph, who's who's just gone through these incredible changes in life. And yet God has been there. And what we find out through Joseph's story is that not only was God present and protection, or protective and provisional, but that when our plans change, we can trust that God has a better plan and it's right on track. And I'm going to say that again. We, when our plans change, we need to trust that God has a better plan and it is right on track. When the time comes for Joseph to reveal his identity to his brothers, Genesis 45, uh, starting in verse 4, it says, Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Who sent him? God. God sent him. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you. Who sent him? God. To preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. God. All along, God had this plan for Joseph that was right in line for a greater purpose. And it never wavered. It never took a wrong turn. Amen to that. That's one of the things I love about Joseph's story is how he, through every turn of his life, he seems to just roll with the punches. Now, we don't know what his, his internal mental or emotional state was. I mean, he went through some pretty rough stuff. But what we have in scripture is he makes the best of every situation. He maintains integrity in every situation. He obeys God in every situation. He had lots of opportunities to get angry, lots of opportunities to turn his back, but he doesn't. He courageously walks down his path of life with all of its twists and turns. We should take a lesson from Joseph that when life takes a turn, we put our trust in Jesus and we walk with integrity and we walk with obedience down that path. Yes. Because we know that God has a plan that's right on track. And if you don't know that, there's a couple promises in the scripture that I want to share with you. The first one is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God has a plan to prosper us, to give us hope and a future. But that doesn't mean that the road to that future won't be wrought with twists and turns. Or how about this one? This is a familiar, familiar well-throw passage. 
The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus promises that he came that we might have a full life. But it doesn't mean that there aren't going to be thieves along the road trying to steal, trying to kill, trying to destroy. Life happens. Our plans change. God's plan doesn't. It's right on track. Through the life of Joseph, Joseph, God illustrates his willingness to stand by us, to protect us and provide for us when life as we planned it takes a turn. And as we continue to navigate those turns in life, be it a pandemic that shuts down the world or any other unplanned event, let us trust in God and live out our faith with integrity, with obedience, knowing that there is one plan that will never fail. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the life of Joseph. Lord. We thank you uh, for the many ways it illustrates um, how you work out all things for the good, Lord. And God, that is such a hard thing to remember and to grasp when life takes a wild turn that we weren't under, expecting. But Lord, help us through your spirit to constantly remember that you have a plan that won't be thwarted, that will never fail. And help us to obediently, confidently, and with integrity walk through the twists and turns of our life, Lord, knowing that you have a plan. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Jesus, we love you. We're so thankful to be with you. We're so thankful to hear stories about Joseph, stories about faith, stories about the unexpected when you come through in grand and mysterious ways.